teachers and the students population uh, i would like to say big thank you for being with us today in spite of busy schedule uh, i don't have to explain about apit everyone knows that for his uh, academic excellence and you know that uh, over 90% of the student population are employed and the employability is guaranteed there most of the times and uh, uh, of course they are having their we, we do everything for the uh, student satisfaction and in the meantime we whatever the desired expectation that we have from the parents side as well so more importantly not only the academic excellence we want our students to be all rounders and we want our students to be leaders in the society we want our students to get uh, balance sort of understanding of the the life and they have to contribute something for the society in return it is not only the academic excellence that is why we need uh, a personality like you to guide them and our days we don't have that we didn't have this opportunity we were you know struggling to you know uh, Uh, that sort of an opinion leaders so thanks uh, dr rohanta for giving this opportunity our student population i'm sure i will request all the students and the whole the viewers and please try and get the maximum out of mr ranjan de silva is a very rare occasion that you are meeting him any question any clarification please do text or send any form of way of you know to reach us we will try and uh, uh, get the uh, reply or, or get the response from him as well as from the panel So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ranjit Sela, once again. So over to you, Dr. Rohan, and Kaushali to uh, to proceed with the uh, the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. And today is a very very special day. Uh, I have with me my teacher, my teacher who taught me uh, marketing uh, when he was at that time. I think marketing director at John Keels. Um, so. Um, Uh, Ranjan is a practical, experienced um, uh, personality. Uh, comes from 37 years of corporate experience that includes over 27 years in CEO roles in three leading Asian conglomerates: John Keels Holdings, Rahim Afro's Group, and the Apollo Hospital Schools. Uh, in addition to his current role. At Sense International, um, uh, I think Rahima Farooz was is is in Bangladesh, and I think Apple Hospitals also was based in uh, in in Bangladesh that you were uh, uh, working on, and uh, I mean that just tells you the kind of international expo- exposure that that Ranjan brings to the table. He has facilitated development processes for leaders and organizations in 28 countries in Asia Pacific, Europe. America and Africa. His hundred plus multinational clients include Unilever, Nestle, Novartis, Merck, HSBC, Hilton, uh, GSK, DHL, British American Tobacco, and 3M. He has shared the stage and network with management gurus of the caliber of Tom Peters, Edward D. Bono, Jack Trout, Ron Kaufman, Bob Woodchick, Robert Holden, and his mentor Omar Khan. He is an author of the book Mind Programming for Sales Success, new further enriched edition of the book, A Better Way to Sell, Sales Mastery through Self Mastery, published by Pearson Education. Ranjan is a fellow of Charter Institute of Marketing and a past chairman of the Charter Institute of Marketing Sri Lanka branch. His theoretical grounding is derived from the postgraduate diploma in marketing from the Charter Institute of Marketing UK. He received the gold medal for the best results in the world at the final examination. His MBA is from the Postgraduate Institute of Management, University of Sri Jawaharlalpura. He is a master practitioner, neurologistic programming NLP. He is currently pursuing his doctoral study in organizational change at the Astrid University, United Kingdom. I'm I'm really proud, Ranjan, that I I got a chance of uh, reading out your profile. Uh, uh, and you know, I apart from you being an outstanding uh, human being, uh, to bringing such glory not only just to uh, your family but to Sri Lanka when you won that gold medal from the Charter Institute of Marketing. You know, you know, we were students watching you. Uh, you know, when you were hitting John Keels, and um, you know, for us, you were our mentor and our. Role model, 
And today you are the partner, senior management consultant, Sense International, executive leadership coach, and consultant and catalyst for uh, Sense International. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Ranjan De Silva. Thank you so much, Rohanta. Um, such a privilege and honor to be with uh, all of you. It, um, it takes me back to the time, uh, I think it was almost exactly 30 years ago, back in 1990, when I was an MBA student. Um, <clears throat> and I do understand most of you are in the MBA batches as well. Um, it's a long journey ahead. But those were days which uh, really got us thinking. In fact, uh, one of the things I realized when I was doing the MBA course was the acronym stood for mentally below average. I realized how much I did not know. And of course, now that I'm pursuing the doctorate, someone said that stands for partial head damage. I hope that won't be an outcome in my process. Um, it's all amazing uh, learning and uh, educating ourselves uh, as we move through such interesting times like the pandemic the world is facing and coming with us the, all the economic um, and psychological and social challenges uh, that we see. Uh, so Rohanta requested me to talk about how do we stay focused uh, in this kind of challenging situation. Um, and while uh, it's a little bit narrow in the area of career and studies, um, I would like to expand this talk a little bit more uh, overall focused in life itself, where our career and uh, studies are obviously uh, major components, at least for you all at this point of time. And <clears throat> these are unprecedented times, times that we never expected. 18 months ago, 20 months ago. And during these times, we have the word anxiety popping up a lot. And if you ask ourselves what's anxiety, it's about dealing with the unknown. It happens when we don't know what we don't know. In terms of an ontology, I normally work on a social constructionism ontology uh, with the belief that there's always a better reality, that we could construct a better reality in the world. And therefore my epistemology or the way of knowing is by trying to create that better way for all of us. And in that pursuit, I stumbled upon the notion of purposefulness um, almost 25 years ago. And this is more than the organizational purposefulness, the personal purposefulness of someone, which is a highly um, misunderstood terminology anyway, because sometimes people feel this is to do with uh, goals. Um, of course, a goal becomes more meaningful uh, when it's behind the purpose. And as a purpose, what I attempt to do in my life is to instill the, the consciousness, the notion and the awareness of the importance of living life based on a higher purpose. And that's my, what my uh, doctoral inquiry is to do uh, as well right now. So therefore, rather than <clears throat> giving a lecture about my life or telling my story, which I will, of course, uh, pop into if required as we go along. I think Rohanta has quite adequately uh, given those details and I'm sure some of you read the introduction before you committed your precious time to being in this uh, event. Uh, so I'm not going into that, but rather allow me to present to you some tools that you could use to deal with the current anxiety, stress, the unknown and the various challenges uh, we are going through. So whilst I speak, I also invite all of you to type into the chat any specific questions you would have related to psychological, sociological, organizational, 
challenges that you may be facing, emotional, behavioral, all that put together. So please do type it in so that as I move along, I could pick on them and also when it comes to the Q&A, we will also have uh, interesting questions to work on. So do give us a how-to question. How to or how do I? And so that's the type of question which makes me uh, quite engaged and excited. So I'd like to bring, uh, introduce to you and provide to you some tools from the science of neuro-linguistic programming. NLP uh, is the shortened form for this uh, science, sometimes also known as a pseudoscience, uh, which was introduced around, uh, you know, 50 to 60 years ago by Dr. Richard Bandler and Dr. John Grinder, both of whom were in the same uh, class doing their PhD, inquiring into human excellence. And their question was, what's the difference that makes the difference in some people? How come some people are on top of their game in different fields, be it businessmen, uh, motivational speakers, athletes, um, musicians, entertainers, scientists, uh, politicians. So take some of the best in the world, the cream. What's the difference that makes the difference in them? And this inquiry gave birth to the science of neuro-linguistic programming, which explains that all of them had a set of mental tools driven by certain attitudes and values and beliefs which are useful to the flourishing of this world which help them to be up there in that game. So let me introduce some tools from the science of NLP to start with then I'll talk about purposefulness and some stress management tools to help you to stay focused in what you're doing right now. So, uh, Prathana, you may want to start sharing some of the slides as we move on. So, mental habits for success. So, the first habit uh, is called physiology. Now, physiology is to do with your body, the movement of the body, the, the science of the body. Normally, <clears throat> people act the way they feel. If you feel happy, what would you do? Now, I will be asking questions as I go on. I know this is not an interactive session. I cannot hear you as if, we, if, if, if you are in a, in a classroom or even an interactive uh, video session, uh, given the structure. However, you may want to type in, when I ask questions, do type in something into the chat so that I can see that there is some living, breathing person on the other side of the black curtain. Um, so, the question is, what would you do when you feel happy. I'm sure you would uh, say some of us would be perhaps uh, we smile and laugh, dance. So each one of us would have a different behavior for the emotion happy. How would you react when you feel sad? Again, reflect on it. Maybe cry, frown, get into a shell. How would you behave if you are angry, if you feel angry? Maybe scream, be violent or just, you know, shut up and wait. Uh, and of course, we see that behavioral change in our physiology. And in all these three examples, what came first? And I'm sure if you're paying attention, you would say what came first was feeling rather than action. We felt happy, acted happy. Felt sad, acted sad. Felt angry, acted angry. However, NLP found out that the most successful people in the world did it the other way around. They acted the way they wanted to feel. So if they wanted to feel happy, they did happy things. They acted happy, you know, listened to their favorite music, ate their favorite food, called their best friend. They did something, they took action. And as you took action, the physiology changes. And as the physiology changes, it activates something in your neurons which helps you to start feeling happy. You may right now try this out. Just imagine if you 
change your physiology to a physiology like this. If you just come forward, put your hand on the head, start rubbing your forehead and grinding your teeth. And please try to do that yourself as I do this. And as you change your physiology, feel what you feel. And then change your physiology, just open your hands out and start waving at each other. What would you feel? And I'm sure the change in physiology took you from sad to happy or from a negative emotion to a positive emotion. And this shows that we don't have to get emotionally uh, drained or affected negatively when the traffic is bad or when the boss shouted at you or when your lecturer you know, did not explain something properly or when you had a tough examination paper or when your mother-in-law did not open the door for you or because someone decided to start a pandemic for your amusement. You don't have to get upset for that. We can choose our emotion by choosing our physiology. So the first takeaway for you is from now onwards, rather than allowing this stuff that we cannot control to affect our emotion, change your physiology. Of course, take action to change the situation if you could. Otherwise, change the physiology, change your attitude and start feeling better. I'm sure you experience this. If you sometimes you see a friend of yours seated in a negative way, you know, like this, and you will realize that something is wrong with him or her. And what do you do? You go and say, come, come, let's go for a walk. Let's have a chat. Let's talk about it. And we try to take them off the chair and go on a walk. And as they stand up and start walking with you, they start feeling better. And why is that? And that's because they change their physiology. So that's question number one. Uh, the tool number two is called the pink elephant. Now, let me again give a little exercise for you to do with me. And please do uh, reply me on the chat so that I know how this is, uh, uh, you know, connecting with you. So right now, think of anything, but please don't think of a pink elephant. Think of anything in this world, but please don't think of a pink elephant. That's all, all I request you to do. Think of anything else, but not a pink elephant. Now, what do you think about? Could you type it in? When I say don't think of a pink elephant, what did you think about? I'm sure most of you would have thought about a pink elephant. Because the brain does not understand the word don't. So if I say don't think of a pink elephant, that's what you'll think of. I do not want you to think of a pink elephant. I should have said think of a blue elephant or think of a black elephant. If I say don't come late, and that's what works on the head. So rather... Let's change it to come early, come on time. Don't fail the examination. Pass the examination. Um, don't uh, delay that shipment. Get it delivered on time. Don't get angry. Stay happy. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Calm down. And as we start taking the don't out of our vocabulary, you start feeling better, you start feeling different. So that's the second tool. When you say the tool Pink Elephant, it's about eliminating the don'ts out of your vocabulary. So don't be anxious. Be calm. Focus. So as you speak to yourself, changing your vocabulary, uh, you start. And every time you use a negative word, you're saturating yourself with negative energy. Or if you have a negative physiology, you saturate yourself with negative energy. So these are simple tools to get rid of your negative energy and start inviting positive energy to flow into all the cells in your body. The third tool is questions are the answers. If you ask yourself a positive question, the brain will give you positive answers. If you ask yourself a negative question, the brain would give you negative answers. If you ask yourself, why am I so unsuccessful? The brain might say, oh, that's because I was born in a third world country. That's because the education was poor. The politicians were corrupt. The roads were full of traffic. Boss hates me. Mother-in-law would kill me. My father didn't love me. Loved my sister better than me. But I didn't have a sister. If I had a sister, my father would love my sister better than me. 
And we give all kinds of reasons which is not going to help us. So wouldn't it be better to say, how can I be more successful? Rather than why am I not successful? Rather than saying, why this pandemic? Why not say, how can I make the best of it? You know, why do I have to go online and learn? How can I make that online experience most enjoyable and most engaging and most effective? So changing the, I mean, it's almost like we are born preloaded with the knowledge of the universe. And what we are doing here is extracting it by asking the right questions. Someone said we don't actually learn, we just remember when we read a book or go to a class. So the third, these are the three powerful and basic tools from NLP, the physiology, pink elephant, and questions are the answers. And that alone can start making a huge change with regard to your attempt to focus so that everything else which is taking your focus away can be kept away so that you can start focusing on what is really important in life. Let me go into the next uh, idea, which is another set of tools from NLP, which is called transformational vocabulary. NLP found out that the most successful people transform their attitudes and beliefs uh, and the way they felt by transforming their words. It's a little bit like the pink elephant we just talked about, but let me just take you through a few words. Um, so first word is anxiety. So if I keep saying I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, the brain will make you more anxious. So those most uh, effective people change this to a different word without changing the meaning. So instead of saying I'm anxious or I'm having anxiety, they would say, um, I'm looking for clarity. I'm looking for new answers. I'm eagerly awaiting. Instead of saying, I'm anxious about the examination results, I'm eagerly awaiting good examination results. Instead of saying, I'm anxious about this pandemic, I'm eagerly awaiting for this pandemic to finish. I'm anxious about my next increment. I'm eagerly awaiting for a good one. So when you say I'm eagerly awaiting, your physiology changes, your mindset changes, and you start feeling different. Let's take another word. Let's take the word confused. If you say I'm confused, I'm confused, I'm confused, the brain will say, yes, you are. Let me make you more confused. When you say, just think about it. When you say I am confused, I'm actually making a statement, and the brain tries to make it real. So instead of saying I'm confused, why not say I'm looking for clarity? I'm confused about this question. I'm looking for clarity in this question. And you'll be amazed to see how you start seeing clarity through that confusion. Let's take the next one. <clears throat> depressed. If you say I'm depressed, you feel more depressed. I just tell yourself I want more from life. I want more from life. I want more excitement. I want some adventure. And as you start saying that, your depression will start moving away and you start feeling much better. So depressed moved on to I want more from life. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> um, disappointed. This is when you're disappointed yourself. Let's say you do your examination. You're disappointed with your results. Just look at it and say, I have more potential. I can do better than this. I'm expecting more from myself. So there's no more disappointment. Let's use it to get to the next level. Let's take failure. We don't fail. We just learn. We had an education. We had a learning. Um, you know, once when I said this, someone said, by that definition, I must be the most learned in this room. And it doesn't matter as long as you take the learnings and do something about it. So winners know to make failure their fertilizer, make their stumbling blocks, the stepping stones to get to the other side. So there's no more failure. We just had learnings and that's what matters. Next is lonely. And sometimes, yes, you might feel lonely when you get locked down, locked in or locked out or whatever or from life, can't meet friends or people. Sometimes we can't feel, you know, and meet our parents, grandparents because of the condition. But if you say I'm lonely and going to that state of loneliness, you feel more lonely. Just tell yourself I'm available. I'm available. Now, please don't take it too literally. I'm not saying when your loved one goes away, you go and say I'm available, take me. 
I'm saying I'm available to spend more time with my family, with my children, catch up with my school friends, start reading that book, start working on that project. There's so much the world needs you to do. So available is much better than saying I'm just lonely. Next is overloaded. When you're overloaded with work, with studies and all that stuff which is happening, and if you say I'm overloaded, the brain will say, yes, you are, and that's more or less saying I'm weak. I don't have the capacity. Why not say I'm over-demanded? I'm over-demanded. There's so much demand for my time and my talent and my energy. That's why this extra responsibility comes my way. So winners never were overloaded. They were just over-demanded. And that feeling of over-demand gave them more value, which gave them more capacity to do more for this world. Next is sick. Now sickness happens when there are germs in the body. Tell yourself, I'm cleansing. I'm cleansing. I'm cleaning myself up. If you had a broken arm, I'm recovering. I'm repairing. So change of vocabulary. Because if I'm sick, you feel more sick. You're making a statement about your condition. And you're confirming it. You're reinforcing that condition by using such words as I'm sick, I'm cleansing, I'm recovering, I'm getting there. Um, next is stress. Now stress happens when we have a lot of responsibility. Next just go out and say I'm blessed with responsibility. I'm blessed with responsibility. Yeah. And finally weakness and weaknesses are basically areas for improvement. So changing of vocabulary and there's much more, I'm just giving a, a few little sample which to get you start thinking and starting changing those words will start making you feel better. Um, let's have a quick look at the area of purpose. I know uh, we are almost out of time, um, but I think I can perhaps go a little into the question time uh, and cover a few more content because I haven't still seen any questions coming in. So we might as well start using um, the questions. So let's start um, looking at purpose. So, as I said earlier, purpose is the reason why we are in this world. And one of the things you could do to help you focus is to find out what your purpose is. Why are you in this world? Have you ever asked the question, why are you here? What on earth are you doing here? And I believe that we are all here to make our little contribution for the process of life, for the continuity of life using our talents, our inborn talents, which we can call it, you know, inherited talents, plus the talents that we have, we, are, we have acquired in this process. And as you start thinking, the purpose statement, um, and this is still work in progress in terms of my inquiry, uh, it has of course changed a lot during my PhD, uh, but this is currently the way I make sense of my purpose. First, asking the question, why am I in this world? Why of my life? I'm here for what concern? What concerns you? Is it poverty? Is it environment? Is it economy? Uh, is it uh, narcissism? Uh, is it bad leadership? Uh, is it cruelty to animals? What are the things in this world which concerns you? And if there's something which always bugs you from within, I must do something about this that could be the why of your life. Why are you here in this world? And then think about what are the values that you would live by, values for a purposeful life. Because a good purpose needs to be supported by values. And what will I say yes to? When what type of opportunities, when it comes your way, would you say yes, I will take it? And that will also help you to say no. So to illustrate this, let me share my personal purpose with you. Uh, in the next slide. So as you look at you'll see the next slide which has uh, a copy of my personal purpose. Prathana, is that slide there right now? Oh, thank you. Right, so let me read it out. It's also visible. Um, my purpose is to live a purposeful life. Isn't that an interesting aspiration? Okay, I want to live purposefully myself rather than, you know, before I ask some, someone else to do it. So live a purposeful life based on my evolving, because the world is evolving, is always in construction. 
based on my evolving beliefs, realities, beliefs, values, methods, and inspire others to consider purposeful living for a better quality of life. So by my life, I want to inspire others to look at me and say, yeah, that might be a good option to at least try out. So living a purposeful life is my purpose and then inspire others to do the same thing. In order to do this, I aspire to live by five values. And that's given in the second paragraph in my purpose statement. I choose to be authentic in living, empathetic about living beings, passionate about life, humble regarding the potential of life and selfless in giving. And I'll try to sort of put those words into a statement uh, related to life per se. And the third part of the purpose statement is what will I say yes to? I will say yes to opportunities to sow the seeds of purpose in the minds and hearts of people. Thereby creating ripple effects that will contribute to a better world with the grace of God. So right now when I had that op this opportunity, I, say, I said yes to Rohanta because this is an opportunity to sow the seeds of purpose in your minds and hearts. Of course, it's up to you to decide whether to let it grow or not. But I've done my part in this world by doing this little bit for you. Uh, of course, if you want to read more about purpose, more a process of how to find the purpose, and also if you want to understand the, the philosophical and psychological and scientific background regarding purpose, which is all my research work, you can go into my blog, which is ranjandisilva.blog. You can read it and figure out a little more about purposeful living if you're interested. And if you have any questions, uh, please do contact me. I'll be happy to en engage with you. Once you have a purpose, you can also have a purpose punchline, which is like a one uh, tagline, uh, which basically uh, says uh, your purpose in a, in a, like an advertising line. And my punchline is help make this world a better place through purposeful people. Help make this world a better place through purposeful people. So that's something about purpose and I would then encourage you to start thinking about your purpose. Now once you have your purpose statement, uh, you can go into something called the daily minimums. Uh, things you would do on a daily basis to start living purposefully. Which is take a baby step every day in your spiritual work. Do something spiritual. Be religious and non-religious spiritual work. Do something every day to develop your mental capacity, your brain, you know, by reading and studying and whatever. Do something every day to develop the, your emotional side. Um, emotions, you know, with yourself, maybe your anger, your depression, your quality of relationship with others. And then physical. Physical is about your health and wealth. Taking steps every day to do your exercises, taking the right type of nutrition, uh, taking good proper rest and sleep, as well as wealth, you know, creating passive income streams by using your active income. So taking those little baby steps in that purposeful arena helps you to start becoming purpose. To do this, I would like to introduce a, a very powerful time management tool. Uh, this was inspired by Stephen Covey's uh, quadrant theory. However, I have uh, bought my flavor into it by adding the purposefulness into the quadrant theory. So if you look at this process, uh, the grid here, you would see on the x-axis things you are forced to do and you choose to do. And on the y-axis, things which are purpose-related and purpose-unrelated. So if you take B1, which is box 1, are the things that you are forced to do as purpose related. This is when you are in an organization uh, or in a country or in any organized situation following their rules and regulations, policies, processes is being forced to do purpose related like paying your taxes, getting your targets, getting your report in, submitting your assignments, doing your examination on time. The, you know the things which the organization wants you to do that's B1. Then you've got B2, which are choose to do purpose related. What are the things you choose to do without anyone else's uh, pushing you to do it? Uh, and these are those things in the previous slide, which is your physical, um, emotional, spiritual, mental 
aspects of your life. So spending time studying, taking part in this activity, uh, this is something you choose to do. Doing your prayers, doing your exercises, that's the box two activities. These are purpose related things you choose to do. Then you got the box threes which are forced to do purpose unrelated. Sometimes we are forced to do things by family and friends uh, which are not related to purpose. So the ability to say no is important in box three. And box four is choose to do purpose unrelated. What are the things you choose to do which are unrelated to purpose? And these are like addictions and bad habits. It could be uh, you know, excessive time on social media. It could be the time we spent on television, uh, gaming. I'm, I'm not saying these are bad as long as you do those purposefully, you know, controlled amount of time. I mean, a little bit of Facebook is fine. A little bit of gaming is fine. Uh, watching a good cricket match is good. But it's not about being into it and so addicted that you don't have any time remaining for box twos. So, you know, behavioral scientists have found out that the most effective people spend about 80% of their life in box two. 80% in box two, because when you're in box two, you're free. And 20% in box one, you have to, of course, go to work and, you know, do follow the processors in the university. Those are all the box ones. But even the box ones can become a box two if you do it with your heart and mind in it, you say, I'm going to study not because I have to do the exam. I'm going to study because I want to learn something. Now you're doing something with your heart. I, I'm going to read these extra notes, extra books, uh, because I want to understand this much better, deeper. That's a box too, rather than saying I must somehow know the minimum and by heart the main concept so that I can pass the exam. That becomes a box one. So putting your heart and soul into something. Even at work, rather than saying, I'm doing this report because I'm forced to do it by my boss, you say, I'm doing it because I choose to do it because by doing this report, I will you know, learn more about the organization. I'll be able to support my teammates to do their work. So they have, that's why I'm doing it. And I'm going to really do it well. So that kind of mindset goes into your box tools. And most successful people spend lots of time in their box two spaces. And with that, let me spend a little time in stress management and then I think we'll have to um, start opening for questions. But please do type uh, questions in. Uh, Rohanta, from you, can how do how is the time management going? Uh, would you like me to continue a little more and then go into questions? Or? Uh, is 7.20 okay? Yeah, we'll, yeah, more the better, but okay. Let's go till about 7.20 and then have a 10 minute so Q&A. But Thank please you. do start typing in any questions you have. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, So stress into success. So first of all, let me explain that stress is not pressure. If you want a definition for stress, stress is the negative interpretation of pressure. Stress is the negative interpretation of pressure. If you look at pressure in a positive way, that becomes success. If you look at pressure in a negative way and say, why me? Why is this happening to me? That's failure. So therefore, the first thing, a lot of people said once they saw the definition for stress, their stress went away because they realized that it's a misunderstood emotion. And having said that, let me give you um, a, a few tools to manage stress. First is called the choice. And, and the choice basically is about um, asking two powerful questions whenever you are in a stressful situation. The first question is ask yourself, how do I take good care of myself right now? And the second question is, can I change the situation? If not, can I change my attitude? Okay, take yourself in the pandemic. How do I take good care of myself right now? I need to look after myself. I need to stay calm. I need to ensure my mental and physical fitness. I need to ensure that I keep my family safe, myself safe. I need to educate others. So whatever you can do about the pandemic, do it. And if you have done everything possible, then you go to the second question. Can I change the situation? No, you can't change the pandemic. But what can I change? I can take my attitude. 
And the attitude change starts with an attitude of gratitude. What can I be grateful for right now in this pandemic? Yeah, perhaps there's cleaner air. Maybe there's less carbon emission. Trees are growing. Water is fresher. I'm having more family time because I'm spending less time on the road going and coming from work. And just think about all the good things which is happening because of the pandemic rather than saying, oh, why is it pandemic? Or any, any situation. Let's say you lost a job. How do I take good care of myself right now? Right now I need to be very calm and I need to be focused and I need to see what I can do. Can I change the situation? No, I can't change the situation. I've lost a job. What can I change? Change my attitude. Starting with an attitude of gratitude. Be grateful for the job you had and what you learned. Be grateful for the talent you have. Be grateful for the new opportunities available so that you can go find something even better. So whatever calamity you're facing, just ask these two questions. Remember, how can I take good care of myself right now? Second question, can I change the situation? If you can change, change it. If not, can I change my attitude? So just have these two questions in your mind. This alone can make a huge impact in your being. In addition to the choice, you need to have a few uh, behavioral changes. Um, to manage your energy so that you can focus. So let me quickly go through a few things. Breathing, make sure you have good breathing exercises. Breathe in, breathe out. I wouldn't have time to do something active right now, but in a longer workshop, even online, we do these things, we teach specifics, but I'm just giving you the broad area so that you can refine it yourself. A muscle tension, uh, ability to tense your muscles and relax. Every time you tense your muscles and relax, you release negative energy. So again, there are particular muscle tension exercise. Humor is fantastic. Always have a sense of humor. You know, watch a comedy, have the attitude of gratitude, you know, appreciate the little things in life. Rest before you get tired. Now, this is about something I would like to quickly explain because you're studying. <clears throat> the brain gets tired when you do the same activity for more than about 30 to 40 minutes. That's why schools have subject periods. So therefore, <clears throat> when you're studying, make sure that you keep switching your studies into 30 to 40 minute blocks. So you do 40 minutes one subject, go to another one 40 minutes, another one 40 minutes. Because the re brain rests when you change the type of activity. When I stop doing this and start doing something else, the part of the brain which was doing the first activity gets rejuvenated as I fo focus on the second activity. And as you switch to your activities, see whether you can switch from a left brain activity to a right brain activity. Can you go logical to creative? Logical to creative. Also, can you switch from a, in a subject that you really like to a subject which is a little bit of a grudgery? So can you keep switching that way? So by, by, keeping, by switching the types of mental activity, you are able to uh, do much better in terms of using your time and having focus in your studies, in your work, in whatever you do. Uh, even at workplace, scheduling your work in that manner gives you more energy as well. And of course, things like exercises, nutrition and meditation uh, are all useful tools that you can use to manage energy. Again, I invite you to go into my YouTube channel there's a lot of material there, like there's a meditation, a few meditation videos you can follow as well as some other tools. Um, you can watch, there's, I think, quite a bit of videos on different aspects. All these are tool-based. Uh, do follow it. I'm sure you will find it interesting. So that's basically about stress. And finally, let me give you one quick tool to give up bad habits. So if you have bad habits like smoking or drinking, which are physical habits or oversleeping or addicted to games or uh, stuff which is really eating up your time, let me teach a tool from NLP before we finish off. How this works is, is this. You uh, close your eyes and visualize um, yourself five years from now. If you continue this habit, uh, what would have happened to you in five years? So as you see in this picture, you see a big television screen in your mind's eye. See a, pic a picture of yourself after, let's say, if you're eating, overeating, 
this is how we are going to look five years from now if you continue it in the same way. You can have it for same for smoking or getting angry or lazy, oversleeping, uh, arrogance, anything, any bad habit which you think is not good for you. Just make a TV screen in your mind and see this TV commercial five years from now what happened to you. Then on the side you see a smaller uh, screen where you see after having given up the habit that you're looking really fit with six packs, you're energetic, you look younger, you see that. And then once you see the two TV screens in your mind's eye, you do a process called the swish, which means you switch the two screens very quickly, 20 times like a heartbeat. You go swish, 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 swish. And as you keep switching, the, la the larger screen gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and the smaller screen gets larger and larger and larger. You switch for 20 times. At 10, you'll have the two screens that have the same size as you see now in the screen. Once you finish switching, in the large screen, you'll see the positive picture. As a reminder, the small screen will have the negative picture. So you're doing a mental change, which will remind you every time you start thinking of that bad habit, what would happen to you. And this kind of process really have helped people to amazingly stop habits that was affecting them very badly in their life. So that's basically my, what I have for you in terms of the content. I could obviously have expanded much more. However, and these are some ways you could contact me. I would like to stay on for a, for a few questions and then I would finish off uh, by reciting a poem for you at the end of it. But let, let me keep that to the last. So anyone with any questions? There are a whole heap of questions, Ranjan, which has come to me. <laughs> they are all WhatsApping me. Okay. Because some are on Facebook. So, right, so okay. they don't have access to coming on this. So you um, might want to ask those some of the questions, at least the summarized uh, ones. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm just clubbing some questions together. Yeah, yeah. And 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 it's very strange, but they are asking about you. They're asking you. Uh, the first question they is uh, you are a very successful business. Uh, person from academic to uh, your your career. Uh, why did you move to uh, mentoring and uh, uh, and and today's program? But today's program was fantastic. Question. It's, it's like this, you know. I actually moved out of John Kills. I, I was on the board when I was twenty seven years, and uh, thirty five I retired. And I retired from John Kills when I found my purpose uh, was something that I couldn't actually serve by continuing to be at John Kills. My purpose was about helping others develop and be the best they can be. And I found that kind of work much more fulfilling and happier. And that also gave me the balance in life rather than that corporate life, which was really eating me up. Um, I, um, while that was beneficial and all that I did, but I realized that real life is all about having a good balance of spirituality, your physical self, great relationship, your contribution. And that was only possible by moving out on my own. And I never regret one minute of that decision uh, because it's all the time it's always being happy and feeling meaningful. Uh, so that's why I moved away uh, and into what I'm doing. And I'm continuing to still do this work. I'm still coaching so many CEOs of organizations. I'm involved in organizations in a different capacity. I'm also studying, doing my PhD, I'm teaching. So I have a life full of those B2 activities, which you saw in the earlier one. I hope that is adequate for now. Yep. In terms of the answer. Yep. There's a question coming from Lasanta. He's on the MBA program and he said, I've heard for so many webinars who try to motivate people, but I found uh, this particular program the best. Uh, so he's saying, uh, but how do I, uh, how can I be happy when my country is bankrupt and, and I'm yet having hope of passing my MBA and I'm going to look at my career very strongly in Sri Lanka? Yeah, great question. Um, so first, first of all, um, I suppose um, I'm not a motivator, number one, because you can't motivate anyone. 
I prefer to offer tools for you to use. Maybe that's why you found this useful. Um, secondly, is happiness should be an inner project rather than outside. Don't uh, um, rely your happiness or uh, make your happiness subjective to what's happening in the country or whatever. Because you don't control it. You don't control it. You derive happiness through what you can control. You can control your body. You control your knowledge. Just do your MBA. Derive happiness through that, the knowledge you gain. And perhaps by doing that and inspiring others to do that, we can make a difference for the country. This country is in a bad shape. It's not your fault. So there's no point being unhappy about that. Be happy about what you're doing. It's not disrespect in the country, but it's at least giving the country a chance by doing your part, maybe study, maybe start a business, maybe which brings in loads of dollars to the country, do something and help the country uh, so that uh, you do your part. So you can be happy, whatever happens outside. It's your inner decision. There's a question coming from Shenan. He's saying, um, thank you very much for this amazing program. It really woke me up. Uh, can I just know one thing from you that a lot of people can't ever answer? Why did this happen to the world? I think he's referring to the COVID. The COVID. Uh, the thing is, if you really look at the, you know, the world started with the Big Bang. And you know the whole process of how bacteria were formed. And those were the particles who started. It's based, you know, I mean, cyber, cybernetics explains the whole process of evolution. So every time these bacteria keep working, even human beings are actually bacteria. Okay. We have evolved over 14 million years or whatever the amount of time. So this is part of that evolution. It, it is a balance is required. I don't know whether there's theories, it's man-made and this and that, but it is bringing a balance. Maybe it's awakening the conscience of people. So for me, uh, rather than why did it happen, I think, how do we make the best of it? What can we learn from it? How can we conduct ourselves differently uh, so that, you know, we, you know, work towards making a better world without, you know, ruining the environment and, you know, everything, you know, the, uh, you know, materialistic greed and all these things. Some of this gets balanced off through this, not only this, the earlier pandemics, the tsunamis and all these calamities are to balance things off. I think if we don't wake up for this call, there'll be a bigger one coming. So it is something which we need to uh, work towards. There's a question from Anjun, again, a MBA pro student. He's saying, you are Rohanta's teacher. So obviously you must be more intelligent than him. Why is it that Sri Lanka has very poor policy leaders which we have seen in the last two weeks on the sugar scam and sugar scam and uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the vaccine which was not given to people over 60 years which are small fundamental policy decisions how do we come to terms with this okay first of all i'm not saying anyone is more intelligent than anyone else uh, because everyone has a different type of intelligence, okay? Everyone, you know, even the three-wheeler driver is more intelligent than you in certain areas. So it's, uh, again, dangerous to say who is more intelligent. We all have our own intelligence. So that's a little point to make. Um, the, I mean, we have, uh, I don't want to go into a political discussion, uh, but then, uh, you know, people in power have to, responsibly uh, make their decisions and they, they, that's the way the government is structured policy makers are structured people have elected this government with some hope with some belief about their ability to do something for the country i'm not saying it's all their fault it's also some things were totally out of control the pandemic um, um, economic issues so I think we are in a very complex uh, world right now. So again, I think if we can sort of focus, allow those policymakers to make their, they make their decisions and do their stuff. Of course, we need to speak out. We need to educate them. 
personally, Rohan knows what I am doing with my team. We are continuously educating policymakers about how to, you know, stop the pandemic, the negative effects of lockdowns, how to bring in uh, treatment. Uh, so that we don't have to rely on vaccination. There are enough treatments which, which can treat uh, patients whilst we do the masking and the social distancing. All those are important. But there are other things we can do. So we are doing our part. So if you can do your part, if you have information, do your research, share with those people. But after you've done your part, see, yes, I've done my part. I mean, you're not stopping. We're continuing to do our part. As you know, Rohantha is doing this amazing Stop the Spread campaign, which has helped us so much. But despite that, it's still moving on. The reason is that, you know, this thing will continue as long until we learn the lesson. So I think there's no point asking why, because we didn't make those decisions. It's the policymakers who made those decisions about sugar or pandemic or whatever it is. Uh, but for us, it's about doing our part. And remember that stress management question, how do I take good care of myself right now? How do I take good care of my family right now? How do I take good care of my team right now? Can I change the situation? No, I can't. I mean, it's not in my country. I'm not the president. I'm not the minister. I can change my attitude. Yes, at, at, at least let me build up my family, my organization, my team. Let me do that part. And if all of us do that, I think we can make some change rather than waiting for policymakers to get the act right. I don't, I'm not saying it's the wrong act or right act. Maybe they are doing the right thing. It's not working. Maybe they are doing what they think is right. I'm not the person to judge. So that's my response to that. One last question, Ranjan. I think it's a lovely question. He says, since you are a business professional and, uh, and you also tend to empower people, uh, that's how I would define you. What is your advice to, to us? studying the master's program? I, I think the advice is that um, always work with an inquiring mind. Um, in fact, one of the proponents of action research, Judy Marshall, says live your life as an inquiry. Always inquire because there is no right answers to the problems we face in this world. What worked for me may not work for you. What worked for Rohanta may not work for Pratana, because each one of us is different. Maybe we come from different industries, different eras, different cultures, different religions. And what worked for me yesterday may not work today because the world keeps changing. So if you are relying on what's in the books or what worked or go Google it if you have a question, that's where you're going to go wrong. Always be inquiring. Ask, you know, why is this happening? What can I do about it? What steps can I take? So if you are always in an inquiring mind, never ever take anything uh, which is written, which is called propositional knowledge for granted until you find the truth for yourself. If you are, even the tools I taught today, don't take it as truth yet until you go apply it yourself, make it work and then decide to take it or not. So that's my advice for all of you. Be in that inquiring mind because the world needs a different type of thinking. I mean, we never envisaged the pandemic, so we can't even, that's why we can't blame politicians because they, never, they were never in this situation earlier. They have to make decisions. So if you have that inquiring mind, maybe things could have been better. Inquiring, critical mind, that, that's my little advice for you. Um, uh, I, can I just take one question more? Yeah, yeah. I, I have time. Yeah, no problem. The question is, you know, it says the best brains in the world are, they say, from medical college. And uh, it's the question is from Krishni on the MBA program. Uh, how come the best and the most intelligent people can't actually find a solution to, to this virus? <laughs> Interesting um. question. <laughs> no, it's an interesting question, but uh, I again, I like that early example about intelligence. I'm not saying the best brains is medical college or this or that. The only issue I see is that medical professionals are looking at the problem only from a medical lens. We are not only losing lives, we are losing livelihoods. 
So the solution for the pandemic is not only a medical solution. Economic calamity is not a medical solution. So therefore, if they are able to look at the world in a more holistic way, of course we respect the medicine, medical aspect of it. But also how does this affect uh, families, psychologists, there's depression, there's livelihood loss, there's suicide. More people are dying from other aspects when compared to the, the COVID itself. Even if you take the 200 type odd deaths, 90% uh, is other mobilities, comorbidities. It's only about actually the real deaths, only about 10 COVID deaths we have. Others are not COVID deaths, something else was there, and of course, COVID aggravated it. But there are about two, three thousand people dying every day from other issues related to pandemic. We need to look at that. So I think if we are able to look at things holistically without only looking at medically, I think there can be much, much better solutions uh, to what we are facing. Thank you very much, Ranjan. Um, uh, uh, are you going to say your poem now? Okay, I'll say you... the poem if you like. Yeah. Or, yeah, let me say that and then you all can do closing remarks. So let me um, tell one, I mean, we talked about the attitude of gratitude. So let me talk about, uh, you know, recite a poem which I really like. It's one of my favorites. And this poem is called Forgive Me When I Whine. So whining is complaining and grumbling, not what you're going to drink in a little while. So it goes this way. Um, Today upon a bus, I saw a girl with golden hair and wished I was as fair. When suddenly she rose to leave, I saw her hobble down the aisle. And then I saw that she had just one leg and she wore a crutch. But as she passed, she passed a smile. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. I have two legs, the world is mine. Later I stopped to buy some candy and the lad who sold it had such charm. I stopped a bit and spoke with him. If I were late, I'll do no harm. And as I left, he said to me, I thank you, sir. You've been so kind. It's nice to talk with folks like you. You say, he said, I'm blind. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. I have two eyes. The world is mine. Later, as I walked down the street, I saw a child with eyes of blue. He stood and watched the others play. He did not know what to do. And then I stopped and asked him, why won't you join the others, dear? He looked ahead without a word, and then I knew he couldn't hear. Oh God, forgive me when I whine, I have two years the world is mine. With feet to take me where I'd go, with eyes to see the sunset glow, with ears to hear what I'd know. Oh God, forgive me when I whine, I've been blessed indeed, the world is mine. So please count your blessings as you go away from here. Thank you so much for the opportunity, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, my teacher, my guru, my mentor, uh, Ranjan Disilva, it was fantastic. And uh, to be very honest with you, we had a CEO coming in from Malaysia today, who was actually one of the top 20 in that country who was to address us. Uh, and uh, But then we realized I, I had to take a decision and I thought uh, that uh, what what our students want is something different. And, and that difference is what you did, Ranjan, and I think it was really, really fantastic. Uh, I also liked the questions that came and I was actually uh, challenging myself as to how to ask, answer the questions if I were sitting on your chair, you know? Uh, and if there are more much. questions, feel free to send it. I can reply and you can share it with the students. If there are more unanswered questions, I'll be happy to, yeah. Thank you so much. and. Uh, I, I would really, really be grateful if one day you can do a half-day program for our team. Uh, I will ask uh, the team to uh, request for a time from you uh, so that, uh, because, you know, right now what we need is uh, the, the how do we handle this situation. And then that handling, uh, very few people have the maturity uh, and the depth to actually explain because... A lot of people don't have the answers. So it's a, only a process of how do you handle, which which actually is what you did today. And I'm actually honored to have studied under you. And thank you so much, Ranjan. And 